for being here today. I'm very happy to have a chance to have this uh, dialogue with you today. So we will uh, start again with uh, um, the presentation uh, of the connection between uh, financial and non-financial accounting. First, on the basis of one report or the first report of the research center, and then uh, on the basis of uh, questions that I have prepared for you, Mardi, and also uh, questions from the audience. So before starting, let me uh, recall the, the rules uh, for today. So we will ask every participant to mute their microphone and stop their camera. Um, and um, all the questions are welcome through the chat. Um, in terms of agenda, um, we'll have a, I will perform the presentation of the report for about 20 minutes. And then I have uh, prepared a list of questions for Mardi. And uh, Mardi will have around 30 minutes to answer to those questions and uh, develop maybe around the, what's new today uh, for the CDSB. But before starting, um, Mardi, if you could maybe uh, present yourself and I will do the same afterwards. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me here today, this really exciting year anniversary. Well done, everyone. It's no mean feat. My name is Mardi McBrien and I'm the Managing Director at the Climate Disclosure Standards Board. And we work and have worked for the last 15 years to try and develop frameworks, tools um, to help include climate, environmental and more recently social issues into mainstream corporate reports with the same rigor as financial information. So we really existed in the absence of an international accounting standards approach to undertake uh, this kind of reporting. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more as we go through the questions today about some of the other activities that we do and other points that might be of interest to, to all of you at the moment, but welcome questions in the chat. Thank you. I look forward to the presentation. Thank you very much. So um, let me present the first report that we have published. Um, so we have published it uh, last uh, summer in July. Uh, it was connection between financial and non-financial accounting, but actually it's the first of uh, a list of reports that we have been working on this year with my colleagues. The next ones that are going to be published uh, are the following. So one on multi-capital accounting models and um, SWAT IB is going to present that report uh, soon after our session. Then there is another report on accounting for planetary boundaries and social foundations that will be presented by Richard Jabot uh, in the session following the one from SWAD. Uh, then we also have worked uh, obviously on our model, on the report presenting our model, LIFT's accounting model, that will be uh, presented by Nicolas Antome and myself uh, during uh, at lunch, around lunchtime today. And um, Eugenie Four will uh, also present this afternoon three reports on the SMEs case studies that we have been working on this year. So as you can see, the research center is really uh, working on this model, but around this model, we have been developing those uh, reports to deep dive into science and also to have in open source the methodologies that we are developing at the same time. Um, as uh, Delphine presented uh, briefly uh, in the introduction of this uh, day today, uh, the report uh, works on three pillars, build the accounting of the future, and uh, this is our, mainly our uh, lift model that we are going to present to you today. Uh, we also work on uh, harmonization and standardization. Uh, and specifically, uh, Delphine has been part of the EFRAG task force for the European uh, standardization of extra financial information. And I've been uh, working on this uh, uh, task force as well. And our third pillar is uh, supporting the financial professionals in the in transition. And this is important because this first report really fits into the third pillar. Because what we have 
tried to do in this report is analyze and decipher international standards and their evolution. So this is for the first part related to accounting, but the report released the objective was to draw a panorama overview of uh, multi-capital uh, accountings and models that already exist. And uh, today, uh, with Mardi, we also get a chance to offer you insights into the evolution of the field. So I think we have a pretty complete session with both uh, information to understand uh, what already exists in terms of standards, but also understanding what is coming uh, in the very near future in terms of evolution of the, of the landscape of standardization. So this first report was published last summer. And uh, what we wanted to do is really a panorama of uh, a large number of initiatives linking non-financial to financial accounting. And to do so, we looked at uh, what had been uh, developed by uh, researchers, practitioners, and standard setters uh, in the field of connection between environmental and social issues and with the financial accounting. So the report is structured into three parts. The first part is uh, about financial accounting. The second one is about new multi-capital models. And the third one is about analogous models. Analogous models are models that are uh, not uh, monetar on related to monetary units, but that will use uh, accounting schemes with debit and credit. So today or this morning, I will only talk about the first part of the report, financial accounting, because the second part of the report, new multi-capital models, because it's so important and there are so many models, we have decided to uh, prepare a report that would be only um, developed, that would only develop those models. And this is a second report that uh, has been developed by the chair and that will be presented by Swat Taibi just after our session. So she will uh, perform a deep dive into those models. And as for the analogous models, uh, they are so close to the accounting uh, models that uh, we have been developed in our uh, LIFTS model that we have uh, developed an uh, appendix to our LIFTS model report to go also further into this, uh, this uh, information. So for those two second parts, we really went further in other reports. Um, so in terms of financial accounting, and uh, I'm going to really focus on this part uh, now, um, we developed this first part in, in, in the following manner. First, we looked at the accounting standards themselves. And uh, what we looked at are uh, first, what exists in terms of accounting standards for operations. So for instance, when a company needs to book for remediation, remediation costs, for instance, in terms of environment, what does already exist uh, in the accounting standards, uh, whether IFRS or French uh, accounting standards. Then we looked at investments and fixed assets. When companies invest in um, um, assets which are linked to environmental remediation, for instance, are there already uh, accounting standards uh, specific to these uh, operations? Then we looked at provisions, depreciation and amortization and impairment of assets, and how can uh, environmental issues already be um, implemented or accounted for? And uh, last, we looked at emission of uh, or accounting for emission rights and energy certificates, which are specific transactions that are very much linked to environmental issues. The second part of the report related to off-balance sheet commitments and disclosures, meaning that even if we don't account directly for um, transactions related to environment or social issues into the books, 
they are a lot of standards and IFRS standards that give us information on disclosures. Disclosures meaning that we have to give narrative information on some issues. Um, and further than the financial statements, we look at what need to be included in the management report in, uh, in connection with uh, extra financial information. And we found many uh, information in the NFRD or even in the risk factors of the management report or in the governance part of the management report. And finally, uh, the last part of this first uh, session, section of the report is about the reinterpretation of IFRS. And by that, we looked at one of the documents from the CDSB, former document that uh, was called Unchartered Waters, that was very interesting in uh, the way it was reinterpreting IFRS. But we also looked at concepts such as capital, intangible assets and performance and uh, looked at how they can be questioned and how the definitions that are uh, used usually could be challenged to include environmental and social issues. So if, we, I, go, if I go back to accounting standards, um, we saw that uh, um, there are already uh, IFRS standards that can be used uh, to account for environmental or social uh, uh, transactions. In particular, um, IS 16 and IS 38, which relate to tangible assets and intangible assets, but also IS 37 on provisions or IS 36 on impairment. Uh, IFRS 3 on goodwill when there is an acquisition of company uh, definitely is helpful to understand how social issues and uh, human capital can be included in the balance sheet of companies. When we looked at human capital, we didn't see that many uh, standards, but probably IS 19 on employee benefits could be looked at. Uh, to uh, incorporate some of the social uh, uh, issues that uh, we are looking at when we look at uh, CSR uh, uh, tra uh, related transactions. Uh, what we also did, uh, not only did we look at IFRS, but we looked also at IFRIC. IFRIC are interpretations. And what we saw is the fact that for natural capital, for the environment, uh, the IASB has already developed <coughs> uh, quite a few interpretations. So I'm not going to give the details of those interpretations, but even if we just looked at the title of the interpretation, we can see that the ISB went pretty deep into uh, proposing some transactions related to specific environmental related issues. So for instance, IFRIC 1 uh, looks at the changes in existing decommissioning, restoration and uh, similar liabilities. IFRIC 3 is about emission rights. So this is to me a very important interpretation, even if it didn't last long because it was published in 2004 and was withdrawn the year later in 2005. But still, we looked at uh, IFRIC 3 in our report, and we also looked at the uh, accounting scheme that is proposed in this interpretation for our own model, the LIFTS model that we are going to present today a little bit later. And then uh, the ISB also developed IFRIC 5 on uh, rights interest to interest arising for decommissioning, restoration, and environmental rehabilitation funds. And lastly, if we, six is about specific market waste, electrical and electronic equipment. So why did we list those interpretations and IFRS is to show that even if climate is not uh, really uh, mentioned into IFRS framework today, uh, the IASB has already worked on very specific uh, environmental related issues. And we saw that it was very important to look at what already exists before proposing something innovative and new. 
What is very interesting is that while we were working on our report, uh, the ISB was also doing, in a sense, the exact same work because they had developed uh, a first with a, um, a document by Nick Anderson, um, a list of standards which is more or less the same as the list we have prepared, where we can already uh, book some transactions related to climate. And they published this uh, guidance, which is an educa educational material in November uh, 2020, so very recently. And at the same time, the CDSB uh, published a very interesting document called Accounting for Climate, where uh, the CDSB took four IFRS standards and explained with very interesting examples how existing IFRS can be used to already account for some climate related transactions. So what we can see is that um, our uh, concern, which was how can we use the standards as they are today to already account for um, environmental related transaction is a concern that was shared not only by the research center from, the, from Odensia, but from the ISB and CDSB as well. So this is, I believe, a perfect transition to uh, start my question to Mardi. And actually, Mardi, my first question to you is the following. Uh, we, I have uh, mentioned at least two documents from CDSB that uh, are really uh, centered on accounting uh, and IFRS. Uh, Unsheltered Waters that was uh, published in 2018, and more recently, this document, uh, Accounting for Climate. And uh, my first question is, uh, why was it uh, important from the beginning for CDSB to link climate-related reporting with financial accounting? Thank you. Um, great question. I, I think this goes right back to CDSB's beginning. Uh, and we were set up to help companies do what companies should do, which was report risk and opportunity to investors. And at the time we were set up in 2007, Climate was a, you know, an, an item that was starting to appear more and more on on global agendas, but there was no one way to report it. And we very much, and the board of CDSB very much um, understood that it was a, you know, a serious material business risk or opportunity, and it needed to be treated the same and given the same importance as financial information. Did. So when CDSB was set up, if you think CDSB, IASB, lots of similarities, it's no coincidence that in the names and the acronyms look similar, that the, the terminology used in our framework and IASB standards look similar. It's no, no coincidence we have um, principles. And so we were really set up and we're only set up as a project. We're not set up as our own organization because we're not supposed to live forever. We're just filling a gap until, uh, and it was always said, we just needed to exist and keep moving this agenda forward until a global authoritative body, and we always said it was someone like the OECD and their multinational guidelines or the IFRS Foundation were ready to start um, moving this agenda forward and coalescing and, and driving, you know, sort of um, bringing all the good work that's been done in the market together. And at that point, we'd always plan to give our framework and all of our thinking across to, to that that multinational body, we may be closer to that than we than we once thought. But so these accounting for climate and uncharted waters documents are very much trying to help people understand that this isn't really about a new framework or a new way of reporting. You can use what you have, and it's just a new way of, of you know use the tools and resources and the existing accounting standards to report on new issues. We do have two more accounting for climate papers coming out, one in September and one in October. Very very detailed. Um, on different accounting, two different sites of different accounting standards on top of what we have there that further build, build off Nick Anderson and the Australian Accounting and Audit Standards Board's work. Um, and we also have a short briefing note on what net zero looks like on balance sheets because, you know, I think you all know we're seeing lots and lots of companies over the last few months as we lead up to the Paris Climate Talks commit to net zero that actually when the rubber hits the road, what does that really mean? And what's that, you know, what does that mean from a monetary perspective? So we're doing a little bit of guidance on that as well. 
Thank you very much. Um, my next question, uh, Mardi, is uh, uh, related to what tr the trustees of the ISB uh, have recently uh, decided to develop. It's uh, actually a, a different board than the, the IFRS board. It's a sustainability standard board, a second leg in, uh, in a sense. And um, I wanted to know what, how does the CDSB cooperate with the trustees of the ISB currently? Thank you. So earlier this year, we were invited um, with SASB, the IRC, WEF and TCFD to form a technical readiness working group by the trustees to help um, along, along with the IASB and um, IOSCO as observers. I also think FASB might observe some of the really technical work um, to start to, to build off the prototype that was launched last year to see if we could help create some of the technical work to give the new standards board a kickstart because the standards board has said that it will build off existing matters and move to climate first. So we're lending all of our IP from the last 15 years of our work, um, as are the other organisations, to help help the trustees move this agenda forward at the pace that it needs to be moving. Thank you very much. Um, CDSB has historically been re working on a climate related reporting. Uh, one of the other documents that was very much looked at uh, and very interesting recently is this, the prototype. Um, how does the CDSB, uh, you already uh, talked a little bit about it, but uh, maybe how does CDSB work with those uh, other organizations that we see on this document, which are CDS, CDP, sorry, GRI, uh, integ um, IRRC and SISB. Uh, what are maybe the specificity of CDSB compared to those uh, other organizations? Sure, so so um, we have a good relationship and we work very closely with all of these organizations. We have to since what well, we were set up and then others were set up afterwards. Um, and it, because we all understood that we were set up to do different things. It might not have been communicated to the market that way, but we were all, our work was always complementary. So CDSB has a principles and requirements based framework. It just helps you do what you should do already. As I've said, report in your annual report and helps you with that presentation. Um, SASB provide detailed metrics, which attach nicely to CDSB's framework. And there's, we've done that for TCFD as well with SASB to demonstrate how that works. Um, and SASB also sit on the CDSB board, so we work closely with SASB. The IARC, uh, our framework was written by the same people that wrote the IRC framework, and the IRC framework uh, very heavily draws from the CDSB framework. We work, again, we're on the council of the IRC, we work very, very closely with them. Um, and where I feel the IRC really add value is, is that connectivity and the thinking and integrated thinking that it, it can bring to broader ESG issues. Um, CDP, CDSB is based inside CDP. They provide us a, a fiduciary home, um, which is which is great. And uh, CDP's platform, we always say, is a great place to collect and structure your data that you need to report via the CDSB framework or SASB or, or TCFG. So we work really closely with CDP um, on, on broader technical thinking as well. And, and GRI, we always say that, you know, information from you collect via your reporting for wider stakeholders can be fed through the CDSB framework and into your mainstream report and accounts. So we work closely with these organisations. We have done through the CRD as well over the last five years that that's been, been up and running. And um, so putting together this prototype felt like a natural step because we spent so long talking about the alphabet soup and all these different organisations. But actually, we wanted to demonstrate that you could take bits from all our frameworks and actually just create one. And so, I mean, I mean, the, this version of the prototype that we published in December was not perfect. I, I will, you know, I would not no, always say it wasn't perfect, but it was, you know, a bit of a rough start. It didn't, you know, it was pulled together in a few weeks and uh, just to really demonstrate what could be done with what's already available in the market. Um, very, very interesting. So my next question is about uh, other issues and uh, climate. Um, I heard that uh, you are also working on water and biodiversity. Do you, ha uh, do you have an idea of the planning when those guidance uh, will be published? So at CDSB, our water guidance um, is 
will be released imminently um, with an online e-learning module uh, and that's guidance to our framework but it answers the what does it look like how do i do it who else is doing it questions um, that we get asked every day on every esg topic in the cdsb secretariat so it's quite lengthy it's been developed with a, a global group of 60 experts water and accounting experts so it's it's quite exciting um, so that that's coming out imminently and there'll be a big launch event at Stockholm World Water Week in August and workshops around that and we'll do a series of uh, stakeholder events as well. So look out for those. Biodiversity guidance um, is well and truly underway and that will be out for consultation in August and we will have that finalised and released to the market by the end. I think it's actually going to be launched just after the Biodiversity COP, um, the second last week of November this year and we hope these also, these guidance can be useful um, for the ISSB's efforts as they come to consider other topics beyond climate in the future. Thank you very much. Um, so my next questions are really related to, to understanding some of the big um, features um, that we usually talk about when we are talking about uh, non-financial models. So in our uh, lift accounting model, in the Audencia model, some of the features are listed here, and we are going to explain those features later during the day. However, I wanted to have your ideas on some of them. So for instance, physical units is our starting point in our model. And I have looked at the prototype uh, for carbon uh, uh, from CDSB. And um, I was happy to see that there was one line related to uh, uh, tons of CO2 equivalent, meaning that this is a physical units. Um, so my question to you is, um, uh, do you think that for other uh, natural capital and for uh, maybe social issues that will be developed by, uh, uh, by the CDSB and those other organizations that you talked about, uh, would there be uh, also physical units? I think wherever possible, people like physical units or quantitative metrics, don't they, to help help tell a story about, about reporting to, to act as a KPI. So I, I think we have all have this challenge that other where, where we move away from climate, the, 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 those physical units get less mature. There are you know, standard uh, units for water, for example, we get built, you know, there's, there's some simpler ones, but as we move further away, they get harder and harder to, to look at. So around physical units, there's there's sort of two things that I recommend now, um, and they all do still require work. I would say look at the existing uh, frameworks and standards that, that recommend metrics. So CDP, SASB, and the WEF cross-sectoral metrics for physical units is a really good place to start. And the next... Um, uh, I guess project that I'd really recommend that we all keep a good watch on that I think will be really helpful in providing you know physical units um, on biodiversity is the Align project that's been running in Europe which is working to align accounting approaches for Europe um, as well as methodologies and indicators around uh, biodiversity and natural capital issues and I think that will be a really helpful um, project to, to to pull out those key ones that that need to then be fed through into things like accounting standards and reporting. Okay, thank you very much. So my, the next uh, important feature for our model is um, the monetization. So in our model, monetization is optional, but we we discussed about it and we'd be presented how we see it a little bit uh, later today. Uh, in the in the climate prototype. Um, one of the recommended disclosure uh, is uh, around uh, carbon pricing. So we can say that it's a monetization of, uh, of, of the physical units, in a sense. Um, how could uh, this monetization work to, with other natural capital? Again, I think this is a really good question, and it's particularly become uh, very topical at the moment with the uh, Deskupta review coming out here in the UK, which has sort of started the, the pricing of, of nature conversation and also the launch of the Task Force on Nature and Financial Disclosures, which has also come about in the last last week, which will be also thinking about how what, what nature looks like on a balance sheet. 
but but for you know right now when people say to me oh do you want to talk about monetization beyond the carbon price i sort of point them in two directions one to the value balancing alliance uh, which which we're a member and participate in and also to the transparent working group which is being led by the capitals coalition it's an eu life funded project looking to develop standardized natural capital accounting and valuation principles uh, that in line with the EU's Green Deal. So I, I sort of point people in those two directions for that, that key information around monetization approaches if people want to go in those directions. Uh, because at CDSB, it's not something we, we don't develop those kind of methodologies. We signpost to existing uh, support for uh, reporters. OK, thank you very much. So my next question is uh, uh, around double materiality. Um, in the prototype for climate, uh, all companies will have, I mean, it's recommended that all companies will have to um, to give metrics related to, to carbon. Uh, so I believe that when it's cross-industry metrics, uh, they are considered material for, uh, for everyone. Um, how the, uh, what is the, the view? So would cross-industry metrics be developed for all natural capital or what is the thinking around uh, double materiality and um, uh, cross-industry uh, metrics versus sector um, in metrics? Sure. So I, I did see in the chat from the, the session before that we've been uh, talking a bit about um, the building blocks approach or the the uh, the webinar that was had last week in Europe and and we really see double you know we really see materiality as a building blocks approach financial materiality wider stakeholder materiality and, and being able to be interoperable between those so I you know double materiality um, it is I guess I spent I spent five or six years of my career at CDSB talking about climate materiality what what climate material looks like and we got past that and now we're spending all our time talking about double materiality. But I think we really need to think of it as, as a building blocks approach and, um, and and things will change over time depending on external factors. So, I, you know, I, I really don't, I feel like sometimes the double materiality is a, a bit of a red herring. We have been doing this, companies have been doing this for a long time if they've been putting, reporting to GRI and reporting in their annual report or doing TCFD already. Um, and, and I think the EU through the uh, CSRD has really just sort of, yeah, now said so actually you're going to have to start doing this and called it uh, double materiality. You know these issues are important for everyone and we need to move forward. In terms of cross industry metrics to be developed uh, for all natural capital, there are some already that are in place for um, under the WEF um, the WEF uh, what do they call it? the WEF metrics that were released last year. In terms of developing more, I think it's it's too early to say. We do have. Um, some suggestions in our biodiversity and water guidance that is coming out. But beyond that, um, again, I'd be looking to projects like Transparent and Align to help inform the development of those because they're really looking at what companies are already doing rather than trying to create completely new metrics. And I think that's really, really important. OK, thank you very much. Um, in our model, the external responsibility uh, is important. It's related to boundaries. Uh, in the prototype, uh, I saw that scope three emissions are taken into consideration. Um, and we can say that scope three emissions, in a sense, are uh, related to uh, boundaries outside of the, just the financial uh, perimeter fin of, the, of the company. Um, would this extended boundary be also considered for other natural capital or social issues in your view? I, th I think it needs to be and rightly as, as Bridget has put in the chat it's it, it's outside in and inside out and sometimes the um, outside in can actually have an inside out out effect right so I think these th we do need to be consider considering extending the boundary of of the social uh, of the natural capital and social issues, whether that's something the ISB does or that's something that's done by regulation or via someone like GRI working with the ISSB um, to provide that guidance and that structure. Um, I, I don't think 
we have the answer for that yet, but I think regulation uh, and the CSRD that does ask for water and other areas um, to be disclosed across natural capital and social will sort of start to set, I think that will start to set really good global practice, maybe not best practice, but global common practice that we can all learn and draw from. Thank you. Um, I will now uh, go th through a question that um, is maybe a little bit technical, but still very much of interest for me because I've been working uh, with the task force, the uh, EFRAC task force on connectivity. Um, so if there are two legs, meaning uh, IFRS on the one hand and uh, SSB in the other hand, developing uh, non-financial standards or sustainable, sustainable standards, what will be very important is to make sure that there is a connection between the two. Um, this connectivity is called operability, I think, in the prototype. Uh, and here is one example with uh, emission uh, NOx emissions. Mm -hmm. But um, how can that be illustrated maybe with another example? And do you know how can we uh, illustrate that a little bit uh, differently than just with one example? I think what's important to understand is when the prototype is written, the prototype is written in isolation and not with direct links, for example, to accounting standards. And so as the SS ISSB is now currently redeveloping the prototype, it's working very closely with the IASB on that. And we have the management commentary, which can act as a bridge between the two legs or the two sisters, as, 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 you know, as we kind of like to talk about it. So I think you will see that developed across but I, I think this is where sometimes getting too hooked on the prototype as it's written now might not be the right completely the right uh approach because the iasb is heavily involved with the you know the redrafting of the climate prototype now to make sure the work of the iasb where relevant is interlinked and included and cross-referenced to make sure that these are completely interoperable going forward so um we have this ex example that we put in on, on NOx. It just made sense at the time. But I think we all, when we all talk about interoperability, there's interoperability here, but it's interoperability between uh, existing and, and other reporting approaches. So information that you have collected to, to undertake a, a GRI sustainability report or a CDP disclosure, we also want to make sure that you can use that to feed in to report against the climate prototype, for example. So it's, it's interoperability between reporting frameworks and, and, and between the IASB and the ISSB that we're trying to build into this. So I think that the, proto the original prototype, as I said, was sort of a, a not quite a cut and paste, but we didn't factor in the IASB's work as part of that. So this new uh, prototype, which will be out for exposure later this year, will um, will do that. And I think, you know, I'm already, and, and it's also coming out with a, a conceptual framework and some guidance as well for consultation. So it is a full package to help you understand how to use it as well. Very good. So I'm very happy to to hear that the, high, the ISB uh, is, uh, is working closely also on these uh, matters. Maybe one question that is not written here about uh, the interpretation that I talked about earlier, IFRIX 3. Um, do you know, I mean, I believe that it was uh, very interesting that back in 2004, they were developing that interpretation. In a sense, it's a pity that uh, it was withdrawn uh, right after it was uh, published. But do you have an idea why this uh, interpretation, uh, why the ISB did not work uh, recently um, on uh, emission rights and why they didn't look at this interpretation again? Do you know, I don't have a clear answer on that, but I think when it when it was originally written, if we think back to that time, and that's just pre-CDSB, but also pre-financial crisis, and at that time there was carbon markets being actively worked on and established across Europe, across the UK and across the world. You know, we were, it was all about getting a carbon market and carbon trading and carbon pricing, and that was the thing on climate changing. And you know, it was all about the price and, and getting this market up and running. And then the financial crisis hit and it, it, that went completely off the radar. So, I, and the carbon market, you know, the first carbon auction was only really re recently, you know, in the last few months, we had the, the first big one in London where we got a good price. So I expect, you know, if, if we hadn't gone down the ISSB route, I could imagine with the, with the market coming back, uh, they might be, you know, considering going down that route again. 
but but also I do know that um, the International Emissions Trading Association, one of our board members, and PwC are actually working on some guidance for reporting um, carbon prices and and uh, sort of a bit like IFRIC three at the moment. So I don't have a timeline, but there is people starting to think about that work. So you know it may get thread through. It may also end up as part of educational materials for the new climate standard too. Would be another interesting way to think about it, which just occurred to me then. So don't quote me; it hasn't been discussed. But it's it's just you know ideas like that. Think, oh, actually, you know, there's something good there and something good here. You know, how could we be using that thinking that's already out there? And also, like, in, if you think back, it's taken the trustees a long while to get where they are now, right, to think about going down an ISSB route. It would have been really early for them to be taking active steps back in two, four, five, six. And I think, you know, it, the, step, the guidance wasn't as well received I, from what I understand as they thought it would be. So um, it, and it wasn't as well tested and I guess there wasn't market practice tested. So today as we're moving into an ISSB building of market practice, you have TCFD, CDSB, SASB, the IRC, CDP, GRI. We've got all this market tested framework standards, methodologies, tools. So we've got a bit more for them to build off to get that running start back in four, five, six, two thousand. We didn't have that to, to give them that. Um, that confidence that what they were going to do was actually going to work in the market. So. You know, I think we just got to watch this space and see what happens, but it's a great question. Thank you very much. Um, my last question for you um, this morning is uh, uh, related to your experience at CDSB and uh, all what we will have to develop with our model also is about what should be answered to companies who invoke the cost benefit argument when asked about sustainability reporting. So, so in reporting sustainability, you know, as I said earlier, you are required to report sustainability information by law in Europe um, and by law, you know, anything that's material risk, you have been, you know, quite a long while under accounting rules. So, you know, one, you are actually required to doing it. So not doing it can have implications for your business, whether that be reputation, you know, legal, etc. Um, I think you know, the writing is on the wall around regulation more broadly. And I think getting an early start on that reduces the costs of, of action in the first place. The climate, climate targets are very clear, you know, the EU and there's global targets, very, very clear what, what trajectory we're on regarding the sustainability, sustainable development goals around the CSRD, around corporate governance. You know, the writing's on the wall, the timelines are there. The sooner you get started, the lower cost of, entry, you know, the lower cost of, of getting involved. You've got more time and it costs you less when you have to throw money at it to comply in the end. Also, we're seeing around staff retention and hiring, we're seeing companies that actually do consider sustainability issues right across their business are actually finding it easier to keep staff and recruit staff. We're getting a lot more feedback coming into us about companies that uh, that people are asking these questions in interviews, actively really probing about sustainability policies, activities, and whether or not they're walking the talk that they're, that they're stating in their external communications. I think that's also a really good, you know, you want to get the best staff, you know, that helps your company be as most as successful as it can. You want the best one. So I think that's also another really important part about air sustainability reporting, but also sustainability reporting helps, you know, it's, 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 it should be seen as a business as usual activity, you know, sustainability should be cut right across the business. And this is, uh, this is a way of communicating you know, some newer information and, and how your business creates and sustains value over the short, medium and long term. So it's 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 your story. So why wouldn't you want to tell it? You know, everyone loves to talk about themselves and what they do. It's your your business story. So, you know, I, th I always urge people to think about that um, when, when we're talking about the cost and benefits of reporting, because if you don't, the implications of not telling one story well are worse when the ratings agencies find five different figures online from pulled from five different reports and, and, and ranks you accordingly because that's what they've found, you know, and it's not the story you wanted to tell. So I think it's always better to have one coordinated story. Um, and, and I think the costs and benefits that come from that way out on, on the benefit side. Um, we've also seen a lower cost of capital. I mean, you, you've, I'm sure everyone here has seen all of the fabulous academic studies in this space, but, you know, we always hear like lower cost of capital. Um, you know, you attract better govern, better govern, you know, people to the boards, all that kind of thing as well. So honestly, I think the list goes on and on around the cost and benefits around sustainability reporting, understanding, you get to understand your, your supply chains better, the people that you work with. It's, it's just, 
I don't know. I think it, it's definitely a, a win win there. And I'm and you know, you guys have loads of great research that you can point to as well as part of your work. Yes, so thank you very much. Um, I will now let the floor to the participants to the conference if there are questions. Yes, uh, hi Emmanuel, hi Mardi. Um, I'm just putting my <laughs> face on. Uh, we have quite a lot of questions. I think they are quite interesting. Um, I have one that um, that I find, you know, it's 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 again all about the stakeholders, but it's uh, maybe in a different manner. Um, it's true that sustainability reports are, you know, some some question who reads it? Our students, for sure, the investors sometimes. And um, when we are talking about double materiality, one of the question was, how is it going to be linked also to some kind of communication towards customers? You know, we've been talking about labels for 30, 40 years also. How we can connect all those types of communication together? I think that comes back to telling that one story. And then building out from that, I think what's really exciting about the system, in my opinion anyway, about the sustainability reporting space at the moment is just all the different way, you know, sustainability reporting is changing, the way people digest information and and, and Delphine, you've been on the FRI task force and, they've, you know, everyone's been looking at um, digitization strategies, for example. Over the next few years, we're really going to see the way people consume information, uh, but also communicate information change. I don't think we'll be downloading a sustainability report off a website in five years time. I think that information will be targeted through many sorts of different channels to, to each user group that you would typically communicate, use your sustainability report as the sort of communication vehicle too. Um, so I think, and then that allows, if you've got the one story in the middle, which is your financial reporting with your you know weaved in with all the other bits of regulatory not you know financial material kind of pieces and then all your story connects off that so you've got the breadcrumb trail off to all those other i call it the breadcrumb trail but it could be a snail trail or a, a threaded needle off to all those other communications that you need you know as a business that you need to make so it's all telling one story and and to me that's really really important because you know many people have seen and, and as an example wbcd's research where they take their members and look at their, all of their reports and see if they stack up and, and actually that what's material in one is not material in the other numbers are different in every report it, it you know we need like i said we need one one story and then that bread you know that that knitted so needle out to all the other key stakeholders and audiences around that in my opinion but i think it's so exciting because there's so many interesting and dynamic ways of communicating now with different stakeholders and so many fun ways to tell your story which aren't you know wouldn't be seen as greenwashing you know that's a big issue at the moment isn't it and i think this is a really exciting time for communications around um, sustainability reporting. There is um, loads of questions coming up. I've, I hadn't uh, seen another one on the the, uh, the way that GRI has always been specifying performance norms to be context specific. I think you 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 know maybe on planetary boundaries or. Um, how does that um, match up with the efforts we are hearing that are trying to cascade those centrally defined metrics? Um, can you also talk to this and how this can be done in the future? So we're looking, um, the central sort of pooling at the moment is looking from an enterprise value perspective. So with that, that boundary in mind, um, so it, it could be a slightly different um, snap, you know, different snapshot of, of the business, but you would communicate the whole story right because the whole story is part of your story as the business and then then you would again extrapolate that if you're reporting to a different audience that needed that in a different way and i think all of these you know the issb the work of the csrd europe's priorities the us's priorities australia's priorities everyone's priorities are going to be different when it comes to how you set whether it's planetary boundaries whether it's 2030 the sdgs everyone's is going to be slightly different and so we really need you know, local approaches or, or jurisdictional approaches to helping us achieve that. And, and that will also help to dictate the style of reporting, what's needed, metrics that are relevant locally, all those kind of um, additional information that, that will actually help tell, tell the one story. I think I have a question that uh, many people might probably are asking themselves. Um, let's see if uh, if you have a quick answer to this one. It's a question 
Um, sustainability is a vast topic. If you were to name three to five absolutely key KPIs for a company, what would it be? I know it's tough. Do you know, I think it is tough and I don't think they're the same for every company. So, I, you know, what I would do is I, SASB basically have you know, five to seven, I think, for every industry. Uh, and so I would just go to them and use that as a starting point. And if they don't work for you, find one that does. Uh, that, that's what I'd say to do, because I, I just don't think um, it, they do change. And they do change in terms of importance per industry. So if you just say, well, you know, everyone needs to report on diversity, everyone needs to report on you know, supply, the deaths and supply, you know, I don't think that necessarily applies for, you know, one would be a bit different from a mining company than an IT company. So I think it's really good if you can do it on an industry-based basis because it becomes more comparable and decision useful for the investors at the very least. So it seems like a bit of a cop-out answer, but it means that you're actually going to have, whatever you're doing is going to be useful at the end. Can can we still say and I and carbon was part of the the CDSB school focus at the beginning? Uh, can we still say or say today that carbon has become the currency of sustainability and should it stay it that way? I mean, this is this is a real challenge, I think, because GHG protocol and carbon was out there first, right? And everything else is either been a poor cousin and and hasn't quite had the investment and the pace and it is starting to pick up. You know, I don't think carbon can be the default forever. I think we need to be starting to think about um, even some more maybe holistic uh, ways of considering what sustainability is. And although it's a, it's a it's a good it's a good helpful proxy for emissions, it doesn't really sit on its own without a story. It needs a story with it to to really. Um, Add the context and add, add, you know, if you just have a GHG emissions number or, a, you know, scope one, scope two, three, with no story around those numbers, they, they don't really mean much, right? They're, they're completely out of context. So everything has to come with a, a bit of context and a story. And I think, I honestly think it will move on. I can't tell you what's next. I think everyone just wants one number for everything. But I, I, I yeah, I don't know. But I mean, at the moment, the questions we get asked most are around climate transition. Like, so transition social issues around transition, how do I report, you know, that? And, you know, that's becoming, in all honesty, we used to get asked all the time, just how to do TCFD. And now it's all this transition. How do we how do we report on the transition? How do we think about the social issues in the climate context? And so, you know, if you had to ask me what's the you know topic that is kind of keeping me up at night when I have to think about what I can do to help move the bar on that, that's the area um, that, that's creating the most interest at the moment. There's also a question on integration. I think the term integration has been conceived differently in different different uh, different reports recently, but uh, I'd say it's it's less working in silos. Um, I'm going to disclose I'm part of the technical working group at CDSB. We have discussed those linkages and how we can make them uh, make more visible. I think at the moment they they are not. Um, can you t maybe speak about the efforts or of interlinkages between environmental oh, topics it, 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 but also between social and environmental social topics. And environment. So we, at the moment, we are looking, um, as you've said, we're, we're about to release a paper on on social issues and, and sort of, but that is actually driven by the climate. That's been driven by the transition of the social issues completely because the, everything from displacement to moving factories and jobs and, and going into new, I mean, everything, to help with the climate transition actually does affect other environmental and, and social issues and for too long i think we've been just thinking about these things in silos like oh, we're just talking about climate we're just talking about this piece of biodiversity or we're just talking about you know water we haven't been thinking about them as a whole and you, you know and, and i um and i'm speaking completely as maldi here but as we start to think and we all start to feed into the agendas as they in the priorities of the issb as it goes out for exposure later this year i think we all have to really stress you know we don't want to keep seeing all this fragmented piecemeal uh, issues that have been considered in isolation. We want them to be considered as a whole um, to allow these things to, you know, like you said earlier about climate coming out as winner, actually allow them to be considered, you know, as as what they are, as a material set of issues that might be might be more important at different times based on the business strategy and, uh, and, and external factors. Um, maybe 
Maybe one last question. Uh, I'll see if I need to go up to 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 see. I'm, I'm sorry if I have not answered all your questions on the line because it has been popping up. A question from a fellow Australian. Um, <laughs> uh, we have industry specific sustainability reporting. That's true. Should we have stakeholder specific sustainability reporting? I think in many ways. I mean, I think that's if, if you don't do it already, I think that's the future because I at the moment, I, I think we assume the sustainability report communicates to everyone that's not your financial provider of capital, although they use it, you know, it, it's one communication out that sort of serves maybe eight or 10 audiences, maybe more. And I think for the future, I think you know, smart businesses will be you know, breaking that down by by stakeholder groups um, and communicating and targeting directly at them. I think, and, and that will change, you know, we're all going to have more power to vote on our pensions, you know, you'll be able to do that from an app on your phone soon if you don't want to do things, you know, so, you know, large corporations will need to think how they're going to inform their audiences in, in different ways. And I don't, you know, a 25 year old with a pet, like, you know, it's just starting their pension and playing around on their phone is going to read a, a, a 300 page sustainability report. So how, how are we going to get those audiences to the people that that can affect and, and drive change or might have an interest in the topic? So I think it is going to be much more stakeholder, individual stakeholder targeted and cooler forms of community. There's cooler ways of communicating than just forward. I think that's exciting. I think we've covered uh, pretty much all the questions. Uh, I was just going up maybe on on one uh, last one from Birgit on double materiality. Uh, I'll read it out. She, um, um, she says, I understand that we are very much focused on detailed analysis risk opportunity for the outside in, but it seems to me that we are only considering metrics and target for the inside out. Is there an evolution to also deepen this inside out analysis with real risk assessment on the harm company do provoke in their environment? I, I think the, the I, I think why we feel like it's the inside out is because that was CDSB's mission. Like we were only put in place to deal with that, as was um, SASB, for example, as was TCFD. Um, so that's why this feels like and so that's why the and the ISSB has taken that angle however you know organizations like GRI and CDP are so well placed to deal with the uh, outside in that's that's their that's their job um in many ways and that's why these two initi these these initiatives are actually very complementary and that interoperability piece we have to make sure we get right so the work GRI and SASB have been doing on aligning their terminology and, and metrics is so critical to help with this interoperability for example as we move forward and there's always going to be more work to be done there but I think you know there's definitely the right you know right signals right movement right and momentum like I've never seen before. So let's just hope. I know I know we don't have five years, but you know if we're still haven't have all this sorted in five years and, and starting to see great reporting, if all the outside in, inside out, different audiences communicated different in different in five years, then we I think we've failed completely. <laughs> and I think we need to find you know a different way to communicate. I think that's it for, for this uh, second part of the conference. Thank you very much, Mardi, for being with us. Thank you, Emmanuel, for leading the way. And uh, maybe we can put um, the, the, if you can share your slide to announce the next conference, Emmanuel, uh, it will be in another 15 minutes. Uh, we, you have a, a coffee break, a tea break, a, uh, I, I see people from around the world, so probably also some lunches and other things or tea. And uh, we'll rejoin um, at 11.15 uh, for a multi-capital accounting model deep dive with Sherry Lee Tan, who is uh, with us very early from the US, and uh, Mark Go from the Capitals Coalition, and Suad Taibi from the center, who will be leading the conversation. So um, join us in 15 minutes again for that. Thank you, Marty. Uh, for being with us today. Thank you and thank you for having me.